let's declare. Wandering into the night, wanting a place to hide this weary soul. I needed hope, and I try with all my might, but I just can't win the fight. I'm slowly drifting into the night. When I ran out of road, I met a man I didn't know. And he told me that I was not alone. Come on, church, let's say. Pick me up, turn me around, place my feet on the solid ground. I thank the master, I thank the savior, because you heal my heart, you change my leg. Forever free, I'm not the same. I thank the Master, I thank the Savior, I thank God. Cannot deny what I've seen. Got no choice but to believe. My doubts are burning like ashes in the wind.
Can you put your hands together if you're glad for Jesus this morning? Come on all over this place. If you're comfortable, can you throw those hands up to God this morning? God, I thank you, Lord, for Jesus this morning. God, I thank you for your son, Lord, that is greater. God, than any circumstance or any situation, God, that we've walked in, Lord, to from this week, God, Lord, maybe there were some things that we faced or some trials or some difficulties, but God, you are greater. And so, God, we put our focus and our attention on that this morning. God, we put our focus and our attention on you this morning, and we thank you, Lord, that you are still in control in Jesus' mighty name. Amen and amen. Hey, five, high five a couple people as you sit down. Come on, tell them, say, hey, I'm glad you're here. So I'm glad to see you this morning. So good to see you, all of you here at Valparaiso. Good to see you at our Valpo campus this morning. want to welcome all of you this morning. I want you to go ahead and uh, prepare your offering as we're going to get ready in just a few moments to uh, give that. If you're giving digitally this morning, my wife and I, we like to give through the app. 
So there's an I gave card that looks just like this. If you grab that right now in a few moments, you can participate. If you've got cash or check, you can throw in the envelope. But uh, hey, if you're a first time guest today, we want to say welcome. want to say thank you uh, for coming for sure. Maybe you've returned from Easter. We're so glad to have you here. And you haven't connected with us yet, uh, you can text the word Valpo to that number right now, 219-600-4881. Uh, there we go. Uh, you can text the word Valpo to that. And or right in front of you, there's a card that looks just like this. You can take it out, fill it out. And uh, I would love it if after service, if you'll just stop by our guest services right in the back, just say hello to us. We got a gift card, or I'm sorry, a gift for you, and we will send you an Amazon gift card uh, for filling out that information for us this morning. And so we'd love to just connect with you just for a few minutes, let you know more about Heartland, introduce ourselves to you, and let you introduce yourself to us. Hey, there's some things coming up at Heartland. Uh, May is right around the corner, which is just crazy, right? May is almost here. Mother's Day is coming. And on Mother's Day, uh, we do child dedication here at Heartland Christian Center, whether it's a baby or whether it's a, a child that maybe you never had dedicated, maybe it's a teenager and you're like, I'm just trying to give them back to God right now. Like, that's fine too. Uh, you, can, you can do your teenagers as well. But we do child dedication. Here at Heartland, we don't do a child baptism. We believe water baptism is a decision that a person makes as a Christ follower. So it's something you do obediently. Uh, in Scripture, it tells us after you've surrendered your life to Christ, it's something you do in obedience to that decision. And so, but we do uh, do kid and child dedication. So on that Sunday, uh, if you'll connect with Lindsay, our worship pastor, you can email her right there. They've got that email uh, on the screen. You can jot it down. We'll celebrate moms and dads and the new babies and the kids. And uh, and Heartland is multiplying, and we love it. We've got a lot of new babies here in our church. And so, yeah, that's good. You can be excited about babies, right? It's a good thing. And so uh, also that month, uh, just speaking of baptism, we have baptism night that month as well. Uh, we'll do a prayer and a praise and a baptism night. We're gearing up for our prayer night that night. We're going to open up the altars, lay hands. We're going to be praying for some healing, praying for miracles. Uh, but on that, on May 29th will be our baptism night as well. If you've decided to follow Christ, you've made that decision, you've surrendered your life to him, but you've never uh, taken that step biblically in obedience of water baptism, that public expression of what Christ has done on the inside. That's what water baptism is, that you publicly identify. And so uh, we want you to do that. You can text the word baptism to that same number and connect with us as well. We've got many of you signing up already, and we always love celebrating. It's always exciting when somebody celebrates and dedicates their life to Christ. Amen? And so we love celebrating uh, with them as well. Hey, I want you to stand this morning as we get ready to honor God in our giving this morning. I want you to get your offering ready. Again, I can't thank you enough, men and women, all at this location, at every location. Those of you watching online, man, that we come together as people of God and we steward our, our time, our talent, our temple. Yes, absolutely. Our testimony. That's what we talk a lot here at Heartland. But we also steward our treasure. And giving an offering is not about a, a financial amount. It's just simply about trusting God, right, with what he's already blessed you with. It's about returning back to him what he's already given you. And so I thank you. Every ministry that we do and the life change that happens here at Heartland, it's not just because of a pastor or our pastors, but it's simply about men and women like yourself just trusting God and giving to him. So I want you to take your offering. I want to pray for you this morning. God, I thank you for your goodness, Lord, and your grace and mercy in our lives. God, thank you, Lord, for men and women in this room. God, those online watching, God, that are world changers. That God, Lord, by ourselves, it may not be much, but God, when we network together, when we put our resources together, Lord, we're able to advance your kingdom. Lord, souls are changed. Missionaries are supported. Lord, salvations happen. God, ministry happens because of that. And so, God, as we steward today, God, as we sow into your kingdom, God, there's miracles that need to happen in this room. And your, your word says that you would open your windows of heaven over our life and pour out blessings on us. So, God, financially, emotionally, spiritually, physically, mentally, God, there's miracles that need to happen. And I pray, Lord, that you would just prove yourself true to these people. God, as they sow into your kingdom today, in Jesus' mighty name, amen and amen. Hey, would you bring your offering with me this morning as they worship God in another song?
church, think about this. You made a way across the great divide. And behind heaven's door to put a real inside. And there at the cross, oh, we pay the debt I owe. Broke my chain. Nothing but 
If you're thankful for the blood of Jesus, can you give him some praise for who he is? Come on, for what he did in spite of who you are. God, we thank you, Jesus. Hey, high five somebody this morning. Come on, say he did it for you. Come on, tell him, say he did it for you. He did it for you this morning. You don't feel like it sometimes, but guess what? He did it for you anyways. You get it wrong, but guess what? He did it for you anyways. Amen. Amen, amen. Hey, so good to see you this morning here at Valparaiso. We want to welcome North Judson and uh, Wanata this morning. Come And everybody watching online, can you put your hands together for our online audience, our campuses, NPH, Westville. So good to see all of you this morning, Pastor Phil and Miss Rhonda. They're at our, our biker campus this morning. They got service over there and uh a uh, bike blessing and a bike ride. Somebody asked me earlier, Pastor Matt, you going on the bike ride? I was like, no, nah, I'm a sissy. If it ain't sunny and 80, I don't ride my motorcycle. If it's, if it's raining, chance of rain, I don't do it. And uh, I owe you an apology. I have to apologize to the church this morning. Someone walked in this morning and saw it in the first service, and they said, who made you wear that? I, uh, I'm, I got an IU shirt on this morning. And somebody, no, don't clap for that. Stop. Don't you dare clap for that. Don't you dare clap. I will preach in my jacket and just zip it up and take the shirt off. You start clapping. I, uh, I, uh, uh, somebody asked me in the first service, they've been here for a long time, and said, Pastor Mike, I've been to this church, I think as long as you have, I've never seen you wear an IU shirt. And uh, you have an IU shirt. I know, Aaron, I'm disappointed in myself. I see you shaking your head. But someone came to me this, uh, this year, and they said, hey, I want to challenge you in a March Madness bracket. And those of you who knows what it is, the t- bracket. And they said, we're going to just me and you. And if I beat you on the bracket, uh, you got to wear an IU shirt. And if, and if you beat me, i got to wear an Alabama shirt. And I'm like, Psh, I know college basketball very well. I'm very confident in my abilities to dictate who's going to win the games. Did not realize it would be the worst tournament ever to take this challenge. So I have an IU shirt. This is the only time you'll ever see me in an IU shirt. And so uh, for those of you who are IU fans, enjoy it while it lasts. Never again will this ever happen. And so Doug Bywater, even he wore an IU shirt with me this morning. He didn't, wanna, he didn't want me to feel alone. So, hey, I want you to open your Bibles to Isaiah chapter 60 is where we're going to start this morning. Isaiah chapter 60, and if you bookmark that and then flip over to 2 Corinthians chapter 6, you, we're going to land there as well. Those are Isaiah's in the Old Testament. 2 Corinthians is in the New Testament towards the end there. And uh, it's good to see Brian back from the uh, military. Brian's a Marine, right? He's on leave for a little bit. Good to see you, boss. <laughs> Surprise us this morning. He's home to May 8th. You home to May 8th, right? And so, so good to see you, boss. As a, hey, I want to do one more thing, and I never do this. And uh, I know we had announcements earlier, but I want to give a special announcement. As many of you know, uh, if you don't know, I'm, I'm, my main role here is uh, the youth pastor, senior high youth pastor, Pastor John, works with middle school, and we've got amazing volunteers. And I'm going to tell you right now, we got the best youth ministry around, I'm just telling you. Like our ministry, our youth ministry is, uh, is kick tail. So teenagers, you're supposed to have my back on that. When I said that, you're supposed to yell stuff. Thank you. And, but we've got a weekend coming up in May. It's May 13th and 14th. There you go. They got it. May 13th through the 15th. It's called Lethal Faith. This is by the Never Before Project. This is a stay treat. And some of you might say, what is a stay retreat? Well, it's a retreat where you don't go nowhere. <laughs> really easy. It's really easy to do. And so, uh, so we've got a retreat, but we'll hang out at host homes. We'll be here. But, but particularly, I w- the reason I want to give special recognition to this, and we, we'll announce it, and we're, we've been telling uh, teenagers about it for weeks, and those of you who have parents of teenagers, like, I've never heard of this. We've been talking about this for a week with your students. And, and, um, but this is a weekend that uh, we're bringing in a speaker that is an incredible dynamic speaker. He'll actually be with us that, that Sunday. And I challenge you as a mom and dad, grandma and grandpa, I promise you, 
You do not want to miss the message that he has. He's going to talk about the importance of bringing the presence back to the home. Hallelujah. That is not the church's job. It's not even the youth ministry's job to raise your kids. It's your job. Oh, that's a whole other message for another time. Uh, the importance of bringing the, did you know, I'll give you a quick stat. I promise I got a message today. If your, if your student comes to our youth ministry in high school and they never miss a service, they always come, they means that they will come to 52 youth services over the counter, over the matter of four years, and they never miss a service. They always hear our messages. They always are there for small groups. We preach roughly about 30 to 40 minutes. You would think that's a pretty successful four years for that teenager. But if you look at it time-wise, that that four years never missing a service only equates in those four years to about four and a half days of their life. That's the impact we have on your student, four and a half days of four years. And so that, that weekend, he's going to be hanging out with students. He's, he's, he'll be with us, but he's going to be hanging out with students and talking about some of the tough questions that they're asking about sexuality, about uh, evolution, about identity, about um, why does God even exist. And he brings in archaeological and historical evidence. But the dude can preach as well. Like I've never heard somebody strengthen my faith and make me want to get saved all over again in the same message. And so he is an incredible speaker. And I know sometimes parents are like, man, I don't know if, if, if my student's ready to talk about some of those tough topics. I'm going to tell you, they're talking about it somewhere. And so you, you better be able to give them the biblical doctrine and the biblical definition of what the culture is trying to tell them otherwise. And so if you've got a parent, if you're a parent of a teenager or, or a grandparent or you know students, I'm telling you, bring them. The whole weekend is $45. That covers food. That covers everything. That's a pretty good deal, I think. 45 bucks the whole weekend. My commercial is over. Let's go to Isaiah chapter 60. But it's going to be a great weekend. I hope to bring your teenagers. You drop them off and let us hang out with them all week. Isaiah chapter 60 as we are in this series called Arise, we've been in this series all month. That's our word for the month. We've been talking about Arise. What does it mean to be different? What does it mean to arise as a Christ follower? Isaiah chapter 60 says it like this. Arise, shine, for your light is come, and the glory of the Lord is risen upon you. Behold, the darkness shall cover the earth, and gross darkness the people. Come on, we see it happening, right? It's happening. So he says, the darkness shall cover the earth, and gross darkness the people. If you stop there, it sounds discouraging. If you stop there, it sounds like there's no hope. If you stop there, it sounds like we're going to lose. But, he says, oh, I love what the Word of God says, but, because that means there's some good news coming. He says, but the Lord shall arise upon you, and his glory shall be seen upon you. How many of you are glad of that this morning? Say amen. Arise. This morning I want to talk to you about arise and be Different. What does it mean to be different? Pastor Phil went into this topic a couple weeks ago that it doesn't necessarily mean to be weird, but, but how do we be different? It, what is our response? What is our responsibility to, to be different? And, and I, I would like to submit to you this morning that really when you think about it, I think different should be the new norm. Because normal isn't working anymore. Right? Normal is not working in this more anymore. And, and I think as a Christ follower, and listen, maybe you're here this morning and you're, you're just here checking it out. Or you've been coming for a while. And you haven't taken that step yet to surrender your life to Christ. That's, that's awesome. I'm glad you're here. Maybe you're watching for the first time. But, but for you and I, I challenge you and submit to you this morning that as a Christ follower, we are called to be different. Amen? We're called to think different, to live different, to walk different to parent different, to, to be a husband and wife different. And this morning we go to 2 Corinthians chapter 6. The Apostle Paul is going to give us a definition and a layout of what does it mean to be different. And he's writing the church of Corinth, and he's writing us this morning as well. And in chapter 6, verse, we're going to start in verse 14. He says, do not, everybody say do not. Do not be yoked together with unbelievers, for what do righteousness and wickedness have in common? Or what fellowship can light have with darkness? What harmony is there between Christ and Baal? That word harmony in the Greek is where we get the word symphony from. It's when you get all the right musicians coming together, playing the right, uh, the right note. It produces this beautiful music. It's where we get the word symphony from in our, in our English dictionary. He says, what harmony is there between Christ and Baal? It's just two totally opposites. It's not going to be a beautiful sound is what he's saying. Or what does a believer have in common with an unbeliever? What agreement is there between the temple of God and idols? For we are the temple of the living God. And as God has said, I will live with them and walk among them, and I will be their God, and they will be my people. Therefore, everybody say therefore. therefore. 
Here's our challenge. Come out from them and be separate. Says the Lord, touch no unclean thing, and I will receive you, and I will be a father to you, and you will be my sons and daughters, says the Lord Almighty. Can we pray one more time? God, I thank you, Lord, once again for your goodness and your grace, God, and your mercy in our life. Lord, thank you, Lord, once again, Lord, for the blood of Jesus that allows us to come into your presence and have relationship with you. And God, this morning as we open your word and as we open, Lord, our our minds, God, I pray that you would do that. Open our eyes, our minds, our hearts, our spirits to what it is that you have to say to us today. God, let us leave different than how we were when we walked in, than how we were when we clicked on to join, than how we were at every location. God, challenge and change each and every one of us in this place. In Jesus' mighty name. And everybody said amen. Amen. Different. Different should be the new normal. What, what does it mean to be different? What does it mean to come out, as the Apostle Paul says, to be separated? You know, a lot of times people ask me, how do you prepare for a sermon? What does your sermon preparation look like? And, and normally Monday or Tuesday, Monday, I, who am I kidding? It's not on Mondays. Normally Monday afternoon or Tuesday, uh, Tuesday, I start getting an idea, and, and I'm looking at Scripture, and I'm reading, and I'm looking at the Word of God, and, and I just kind of begin to read the Word of God and see what pops out to me. And, and, and then really that's, that's kind of where it all starts. And, and I sit down in my office, and I work some. But for me, just me personally, sometimes sermon prep happens all over. Like I'll be driving down the road, and like, oh, man, I'll have a thought. And, uh, you know, I'll pull out my phone, I'll jot it down, and uh, when I park and pull over to a safe spot, I don't do that driving. That's terrible. I would never ever do that driving down the road, but I'll pull over, find a safe space to park my car, and then I jot it down, or, or I'll record it, you know, me saying it in my phone, and uh, or sometimes, uh, you know, maybe I'm just uh, like on the golf course, and a thought comes, it's just, I'm in the yard, on the lawnmower, it just happens, and sometimes, you know, I, I just sit down, and so this week, I, I had some things that had happened into my mind, and I grabbed my laptop, was all sitting in the living room, my, my family was, and I grabbed my laptop, and begin to jot some things down, and I asked them, I was like, hey, this is a good good time. You know, you're such a spiritual family. You know, as the family of the pastor, you always just exude with wisdom and spirituality. Let me just ask you what you think this word means. And so I, I started to ask them. I said, hey, I want to jot it down. And I was like, hey, what does the word different uh, mean to you? You know, and, and I asked Trey. And I was like, Trey, what, when I say the word different, what does it mean? And Trey's like, oh, dad, I think like when I think of something different, it's, it's, uh, it's something better. It's something uh, that's kind of be, beyond like everything else that's normal. I'm like, ooh, I like that. And I jot it down. I'm like, Leslie, you know, gracious, like most wisdom filled woman that I know, like what does the word different mean to you? And and she goes, oh, like when I think of the word different, it's something that stands out like, oh, that's different. That stood out to me. That that got my attention. I'm like, oh, that's awesome. And I think of, I uh, asked Jeremiah, my middle child who, uh, who tries me more than anyone, but yet at the same time, he can say things that are so profound. And I'm like, Jeremiah, what, what do you think of the word different when I say the word different? He says, oh, to me, dad, different is something that's not normal, but in a good way, like, oh, I, I would like to have that because it's different. And I'm like, oh, that's so good, Jeremiah. And then I go to my eldest, most spiritual, who should be my most spiritual son, who just turned 15, right? And, and I'm like, Mason, you have so much wisdom full, uh, in, full in your heart now. You're 15 years old. And, and so when I think of the word, when I think of the word different, what do you think of? And I forgot that he's the least compassionate person in my house. And he goes, oh, dad, when I think of different, I think of somebody that's got issues and they're really weird. I'm like, that is not... What I was looking for, Mason. I go, what do you mean? Like, dude, he goes, yeah. He goes, if you was to tell me, like, ooh, they're different, that means, oh, they got issues. I'm like, no, that's not where I'm going. I was like, delete that out of my laptop. Delete that out of my message. And, uh, but a lot of times we think that, right? We think different means weird, but that's not the same. And that doesn't necessarily mean that. I think different, when you look in our culture today, I think different is needed. Because, again, we look around, normal is no longer working. But what we call normal is really a losing battle. I want you to jot this down this morning. Here's kind of the main idea, the main thesis for what we're going to talk about this morning. If you want what normal people have, then do what normal people do. But if you want what few people have, then do what few people do. Be different. Turn to the person you're sitting next to. Look them square in the eyeballs and say, be different. Come on, tell them. Come on, tell them. No, tell them like you mean it. Turn to the other person. Y'all didn't mean it on that. Turn to the other person on the other side of you now. Look them and look them and like and tell them like you mean it. Come on, tell them. Say, be different. 
Be different. Be different. Because, again, when you think about it, quote, normal is no longer working. When, when I think of what we would call normal, when I think of what our culture says is, quote, normal, I look at normal and it's broken. Normal people are running on empty all the time. Normal people are overwhelmed. Normal people are stressed out, anxious, exhausted. Normal people never have enough time for what's most important. Let me keep going. What about relationships? What does the world say? What is normal for our relationships? Well, today normal is just it's being so busy that you don't have time for each other. I mean, normal is, hey, I, I don't intend to take my spouse for granted, but in reality, it's very easy to do. Normal is, oh, I didn't notice it at first, but normal is that we slowly begin to drift away. What about for my single people? All my single people, hey. All my single adults, what does the culture say? Well, normal is to just sleep around and to have sex outside of marriage and just date and try to figure it out until you get married. And later, if you do get married and you start having a few issues, you begin to think, well, maybe I married the wrong person. And so what do normal people do? Well, normal people just end the marriage. And again, hear me this morning, I'm, I'm not saying that there's not times that it happens and there's not moments in life that something cannot be repaired. But do you hear me this morning, still over half of all marriages get divorced. I mean, that's normal. I mean, I could go on what normal looks like. What about friendships? Normal friendships is never going too deep with another person. It's never having real conversation about what's important to you. It's keeping everything surface level and never. It's just walking into the room and saying, how are you doing? And, oh, everything's good. Uh, I'm having a great week when really uh, reality is all hell is breaking loose in your life right now. It's normal. I, I, I could keep going on. What, is it, what about when it comes to work, what looks normal? It's just more and more hours to get more and more stuff. When it comes to money, what is normal? It's spending what I do not have and finding myself in, in debt in a place of life that I never wanted to be. And all oh, I could go on and on. But what about normal faith? What does that look like in our culture today? Well, normal faith is just this shallow and low commitment kind of faith. Normal faith, particularly in our Western world, is never challenge me or never call me to get out of my comfort zone or demand on me this potential. Normal for many professing Christians in the Western world is a lukewarm Christianity, this self-centered spiritual consumerism, this me-driven kind of faith, this practice that is convenient and it's easy and that's the only time I will do it. Normal is listening to a sermon and going to church, but it having little impact on the way I'm actually living. Oh, that's normal in our world today. It's saying that I believe in God, but then living as if he doesn't exist and denying him by my actions. It's getting just enough of a God of God to make us feel better about myself, but not enough of God to really change me. But that's normal. In our world today, we see it. And it's just, it's just normal. And there's so much pressure today to fit in, so much pressure to be, quote, normal. But, but really, again, hear me this morning, is it really working? I could continue on. The normal way to raise my kids, the normal way to bring them up as a parent, that we find ourselves living in a world today that we get so caught up in what we can give them that we miss out on the opportunities on what we can put in them. That, oh, I, I, wanna, I want them to have the best life, and I want them to get in the best club and make the right sports team and be a part of the right group and have the right stuff. And, oh, listen, there's nothing wrong with that, but I miss out on the moments to parent and to train them up, the Word of God says, in a way that they may not depart from the Lord to plant the seeds inside of them as young kids, as young men, as, as young women. What about this normal way of making a living that I work so much? That eventually then when I get to the age where I should enjoy it, my health cannot sustain what I built for, it's just normal. So clearly normal is not working. So there has to be something different. And again, I, I think that's the thing we must understand. Hear me this morning, church, is that God calls us to be different. God calls us to stand out, not in some weird way or that we, that we think we've got it all together, but he calls us to be different. And, and I want to talk to you this morning. Here's the first thing I want to talk to you about is just simply the purpose of different. The Apostle Paul shows us the purpose, why. All right, Pastor Matt, I get it. Normal isn't working. I'm, I'm just as busy. I'm just as stressed out. I'm just as anxious. 
My family looks just like everyone else's family. My marriage looks just like everyone else's family that's in the world. So, so why? So he's going to give us the purpose of different. Here, here is why he says we should be different. Number, verse 14, he says, do not be yoked together with unbelievers. For what do righteousness and wickedness have in common? This is the purpose. This is the why. Why we should be different. What fellowship can light have with darkness? What harmony is there between Christ and Baal? And what does a believer have in common with an unbeliever? What agreement is there between the temple of God and of idols? The purpose of different. The Apostle Paul writes these words to the church of Corinth because they had found themselves in trouble in that particular day that that ideologies and things and false prophets and false teachers and false worldviews that was in their culture in that city had snuck into their church. One particular thing that they had begin to, to teach the church in Corinth and they would begin to do is they said, oh, well, you can worship Jesus just, you know, uh, just by using all of these idols. You can still worship Jesus, but, but just use these idols as well. And so they had, they had had these idols in the church. And so the apostle Paul is kind of calling them out on some things. But he uses this word, this concept of of do not be yoked together. Maybe you've read it in another translation. It says do not be unequally yoked together. It comes from Deuteronomy. Write it down. You can go read it this week. Deuteronomy chapter 22 verse 10 is where, is where this idea, where this phraseology comes from. It was actually a law in the Old Testament, a rule that they had placed. And, and the, the law was simply this, that thou shalt not uh, plow with an ox and a donkey together. Very simple law, very common sense law, I feel like. Um, and, and for them, the, it, was, it was simply for two reasons. Number one, the ox they considered uh, in their day was a clean animal. The, the donkey was a, a, quote, unclean animal. And by Jewish and Israel covenant, they could not be apart, touch unclean things, eat unclean things. So, so they would yoke uh, the animals together. It was supposed to be a couple of oxen. but So the law was do not yoke. And a yoke was something that they would put around the animal's neck uh, that they would then attach to the plow. And they would go out to the field and they would plow the fields with those things. And the ox was, was clean. The donkey was not, and uh, so it would be it would be wrong to yoke them together. Furthermore, they had two opposite natures. I don't know if you've ever been around a donkey. They just do whatever the donkey wants to do. There ain't no telling the donkey to do anything else but what the donkey wants to do, right? The ox is a little bit different. It, it, it can be it can be guided a little bit easier. So they have two opposite natures, and and watch, they would not even work well together. This is what he's going to show us. Again, let me take you back to the context. He says, do not be yoked together with unbelievers. So he's given us this picture of two things that, that do not work well together, that do not mesh well together. So I want you to write this thought down. I'm going to show it to you. Write this down. It is nature that determines association. It is nature that determines association. I'm going to make it really simple for you this morning. A pig has a pig nature, right? Right? Pig nature wallows around in the mud. A pig nature, you know, is just will kind of do what it does. A pig, a pig nature has its pig nature. If you ever walked in and saw a horse acting like a pig, you'd be like, uh, that ain't right. That's not supposed to happen, right? Because why? A pig does what a pig does. Sheep have sheep nature. So what do they do? They hang out with other sheep. They go to the pastures. They eat grass. They, they bad. They, they do stupid stuff. And when one of them follows one, they all do it, right? That's what sheep do. And, uh, and so Paul, so watch this. So Paul gives us this idea. I'm just painting this picture for you. He gives us this phrase, do not be yoked together with unbelievers. For what do righteousness and, and, un, and wickedness have in common? And so a lot of times you'll hear this scripture quoted maybe like in a wedding or marriage or, or a lot of times they... They use this when it comes to dating relationships. When people talk about dating, oh, you cannot be yoked together, so an unbeliever cannot date a believer. And I think there's truth in that. I think there's some, 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 some given truth in that. But Paul is talking more than just our dating relationships. Paul's addressing something that is bigger than just that. That it's more than just marriage between believers and, and unbelievers. There is truth in that for sure. But watch. So again, what did I say? It is nature that determines association. So he is talking about the nature of a believer. Well, what is the nature of a believer? I'm glad you asked that question because I'm going to show you. Write, write down 2 Peter chapter 1, verse 3 through 4. 
Paul shows us and he reminds us that, watch, as a Christ follower, as a Christian, and again, if you're here today and you say, that's not me yet, that's cool. I I hope you make that decision today and I hope you make that decision online. Maybe today is that day that you make that decision. But the moment we decide and we surrender our life to Christ, listen, there is a new nature that is inside each and every one of us. The Bible says it like this, that the old is gone and the new has become. And so Paul is reminding us of this divine nature. Second Peter says it like this, his divine power has given us everything we need for a godly life through our knowledge of him who called us by his own glory and goodness. Though these he has given us, his very great and precious promises that through him you may participate, watch, this is what he says, you may participate in the divine nature. That's what's inside of us, having escaped the corruption in the world caused by evil desires. Paul is saying to us in the same way, just like it would be a wrong and, and it wouldn't work for an ox to be with a donkey, in the same way for you and I, it is, it is wrong and for you and I in the same way, it's this purpose of being different, that you and I must guard ourselves of being yoked with people who unbelieve or who have unbelief at work in their life. Now, what are you saying, Pastor Matt, that when I walk out today on a church that I go to social media and I just start unfriending and unfollowing everybody who's not a Christ follower? I'm not saying that at all. It might do you some good, some of you, but I'm not saying you do that. Oh, what, what are you saying, Pastor Matt, that I go up uh, to work tomorrow and I say, and I line everybody up. I say, listen, I need all my coworkers. I need you to line up against the wall. And uh, how many of you believe in Christ? And if you do not raise your hand, I'm never talking to you again. No, I'm not saying do that either. That would be weird and that would be rude. Because, listen, the Bible also says that we are the salt and the light of the earth, right? And if you're going to be the light, you got to go to the dark places. You got to be there. If you're going to be the salt, you got to go to those places that need flavor, need seasoning. So, 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 so Paul is not saying that we withdraw from ourselves and we sell all of our property and we all move in together and just live on this big commune. That'd be weird. And, and you all know how that kind of stuff leads. And it would just be, uh, you'd get on my nerves and I would get on your nerves anyways if we was all neighbors. So, so he's not saying none of that. So again, look, look at the words that Paul uses. He uses fellowship, communion, harmony agreement. Each of these words speaks of having something in common. So watch, so hear me this morning. This is what Paul's saying to us, this, this purpose. Okay, why should I be different? Why, why should I even stand out, Pastor Matt? Why, why should I change things in my life? Paul suggests that, that, hear me this morning, that when we as Christ followers, as believers, when we begin abiding by the principles of unbelievers, then watch what happens. It compromises the work of the gospel inside of us. I'll give you an example because y'all are looking at me like you don't agree. Because the Apostle Paul is telling us this morning, he's concerned, watch, that unbelievers and false teachers have become influential in their community. And if I'm not careful and if I don't watch out, the same thing can happen in my own life. I'll give you an example. Um, I'll pray for peace about a situation. Right? You ever done this? God, I just, I need peace. God, I need your guidance. And... I just need you to be with me on this, and I'm just very anxious, and God, I just need you to give me peace. And I'll go ask advice from the most anxious people I know on how I should have peace. And then I wonder why I'm stressed out. I'll go and get, well, hey, I've got this going on in my life. What do you think? Oh, I'm here right now. I'd be worried if I was you. I mean, I would be, so why are you even at work today? I would not even come in today of of how anxious I would have been. You should be sitting at home right now with the lights off, with the the covers. I don't even know how you got out of bed today. If I was you, I would be so overwhelmed right now. And then that overwhelming feeling starts rubbing off on us. What has happened? We've allowed ourselves to be yoked with, it, with, with, with things in their life. We've allowed ourselves to now be tied to things that's going on in their, their life and it's spilled over in our life. See, I know what the Word says. The Word says do not be anxious about anything. But in every situation, by prayer and petition, I present my request to God. And a lot of times we live in more out in our life, be anxious about everything and anything. And if I cannot find those things, find something else to be anxious about and stressed out about and worried about. Well, because we've allowed ourselves, hear me this morning, church, we've allowed ourselves, if I'm not careful, I'm I'm talking to myself this morning, I've allowed myself to be yoked up by things going on in this world. I need relationship advice, and I go to people who's never done a relationship right. I need counseling advice on how to raise my kids, and I'm going through an issue, and, and I go and I ask somebody who's never raised their kids in church. You hear me this morning? This is just real practical stuff that Paul's telling us about. 
I'm single and I'm trying to be a godly man and a godly woman and I'm trying to keep myself pure and I'm trying to date the right way and I want to have standards and yet I go to the club on the weekend trying to find my spouse. He's talking about everyday stuff. He says, don't be yoked together. Don't allow the attitudes and, and, and the cares and the trials of the world. He says, you and I, we have this purpose to be different. And what is this purpose? It's this divine nature inside each and every one of us that when we surrender our life to Christ, when we come to him and we say, God, you are my Lord, you are my leader, you are my Father, we surrender the old is gone, the new has come, and greater is, in he, is me that is he that is in the world. So I don't have to think that way. I don't have to live that way. I don't have to walk that way. I don't have to talk that way as a dad, as a husband. And my life looks different. He says, I've got this divine nature inside of me. He said, that's the purpose. He says, that's why you're supposed to be different. And, and then watch, then he reminds us, though, like of our position. So, so why do we have a different purpose and a different position? He tells us, he says, for we are the temple of the living God. And as God has said, I will live with them and walk among them, and I will be their God, and they will be my people. He's not talking about this building. He's talking about you and I, and we forget this sometimes in our culture. We forget this sometimes in our own life when life gets to us and stresses us out and worries us out and, and, and things and trials and storms come. We forget that we're the temple of the living God. That the same spirit that raised Christ Jesus from the dead is inside of me. The same spirit that allowed him to conquer death, hell, and the tomb and the grave. It's the same spirit that lives inside of me. It's the same spirit of God. It's the same spirit of Christ that dwells inside of me. And the promise of, that God has is to live among me and that I would be fulfilled with Christ. That I would have this power that, so I don't have to think the way the world does because my position is different. I don't have to live the way the world does because my position is different. I don't have to worry about the things that the world does. Why? Because my position is different. Does it mean I'm ignorant to what's going on? No, it does not. Does it mean I ignore facts that are happening around me? No, it does not. I was talking to somebody this week. I haven't talked to them in a while, but they saw me share uh, on social media. They, they saw me share like the sunshine video that we uh, showed last week for Easter as we released that. And he goes, yo, I haven't talked to you in a minute. Like, tell me about that. Like, yo, what's going on? Sunshine Center, like, what is that? What, what are you doing? And how's it going? What's happening? I just began to tell him, you know, kind of gave him the five-minute elevator speech. And I heard this from another pastor, and I stole it. But I gave, like, this five-minute elevator speech. He's like, y'all are doing that right now? I was like, yeah. I was like, we're starting. And this is what it looks like, man, $15 million. It's like, you know, God's good, and he's going to do it. And, and uh, I, I, th I think we have, you know, by faith, we got conversations. And he's like, well, you're going to do that now? I said, like, yeah, we're going to do it right now. He goes, but don't you know what's happening in our world? I'm like, yeah, I know. Like, I see. I try not to let it bog me down, but I see. But don't you, don't you know what they're going to say about the economy and, like, what's going to be happening financially? I mean, yeah, I mean, I hear the rumors. I hear what's going on. And uh, I was like, but I don't let it bother me. And like, he just kept going on. And then I finally just had to shut him down. I was like, hey, man, listen. I was, like, uh, I was like, listen, I'm very aware of what's happening. I was like, but this is kind of where I stand in it. I was like, my position is a little bit different, and uh, I just refuse to be a part of all that stuff. He goes, what do you mean? I was like, I was like, listen, I know who's in control, man. I was like, I've got, and this guy's a Christian. He's a Christ follower himself. And I was like, listen, I was like, I, if I let everything else around me, like, dictate what's happening, I was like, oh, you're right. I'm going to be nervous. I was like, but I know my Heavenly Father's got all the resources I need. I was like, he's got all the volunteers we need. He's got all the people we need to hire. He's got all the finances that we like. He's got everything I need. And, and, and I was like, listen, my position, if it was based upon the world standards, oh, I wouldn't, we wouldn't even be planning anything. But it's not based upon what the world says. It's based upon what God says. It's based upon his kingdom. It's based upon his principles, right? And so watch, so, so I get this, the position is different. So, so in Christ, we're a new creation. The old is gone, the new has come. So listen, but this is what we do. The problem is that we try to live this new way of life still in our old patterns. That's what we do. That's what I do. The, the old way is gone. The new has come. Oh, I, I thank God for the new way of thinking, but I try to live it out in my old thinking patterns. Oh, God, thank, God, thank you, Jesus, that your Holy Spirit allows me to, to handle my anger different. And I have this new way to handle my anger and to handle those moments where my temper would like to flare. And yet I still try to handle it in my old fleshy ways. So we try to live this new way of life based still on our old patterns, forgetting on who God says we are and what we can have. Paul comes to remind us this morning, listen, your position 
is different. The reason you don't have to be the way the world lives, the reason you don't have to think the way the world thinks is because positionally you got a different spot than they do. And again, it's not to hold our heads high. Hear me this morning. It's not to hold our hands high and brag and act all proud. No, no, no. If anything, it's to, it should encourage us. Paul says it's the love of Christ that compels me to go tell others. If anything, it should light a fire inside of me though, to go to those who are hurting, to the, go to those who are stressed out, to go to those who are anxious, to go to those who are worried. So says, let me tell you of how I get through this. Let me tell you how I got through that storm. Let me tell you how the moment when I should have been angry and I should have been judgmental and, and, and I should have been unforgiving and, and I should have been all anxious and I could, should have been all stressed out, but I made it through anyway. Let me tell you how I got through that storm in my life because of this position that I have. He says it's the position of different. And then watch. This is the hard one. I'm not going to lie. It's the purge of different. Because I'm going to talk to myself. Because sometimes y'all judge me when I start talking to you. So I'm going to talk to me. That I, I, like, I, like, I like that I can have the purpose of different. Oh, I like the purpose, right? Oh, don't be unequally yoked. Think today way different. Don't, don't, don't be unequally yoked with those people around you. Don't let them influence you. I, I, I love that. I love the position of different. Man, I'm the temple of the living God. That's how I quote the verse, right? You got to sound really spiritual when you say stuff like that. I'm the temple of the living God, and I got the Spirit of God dwelling in me. And, and I, love, I love the Spirit of God, but, but what the Spirit of God comes to do is this is what I don't like. It's the purge of different. Because in verse 17, watch, he says, therefore, come out from them and be separate, says the Lord. Touch no unclean thing, and I will receive you. Therefore, come out from them and be separate. Before the world ever stole this phrase of coming out, Paul was telling us, we got to come out. Something's got to be different. Has nothing to do with my sexuality and my identity physically. He says it's my identity spiritually. And this is what I've come to learn. Write this down. It's not in your notes, but you can take a note with it. That being different means that I must definitively make a choice. That's a big word, and I got it out. Being different means that I must definitively make a choice. Being different does not happen by chance. Being different does not happen by accident. And so the Apostle Paul shows us there's this decision that you and I must make. That's, it's a conscious decision for you and I. Listen, God gives us his spirit freely, his gift, through Jesus Christ, the Son of God. We celebrated it last week in his death and his resurrection. We have his gift of life. We have his gift of forgiveness. But this life of freedom that Paul is talking us about, it's a decision that you and I must make. This is what I've come to understand in my life. The Word of God says that he who the Son sets free is free indeed. So because of his sacrifice and his death and his resurrection, his chain, the chains of the enemy, the chains of sin, the chains of hardship, the chains of the world have been broken on my life. And even though I'm free, I still walk around chained up to him because I haven't made the decision to let him go. He says, you and I, it's this purge that we must make. See, God commands his people to come out, which implies this definite act on their part. Be separate suggests this devotion to God for a special surface, and, and for a special purpose. And so watch this. So separation is not just a negative act of departure. Because many times in the church world, when we begin to say you got to purge yourself or you got to let go of things, it, it, our minds automatically just turn to the negative. And that means i got to stop doing this and i got to stop doing that and I can't do this and I can't do that. It's not just negative act of departure. Being separate, this purge that Paul talks about, it's not just a negative act of departure. Watch. It's a positive act of dedication to God. When I got married to my wife, it wasn't just, sorry, all the other ladies, I can't talk to you no more. That was not the act of departure. It was a positive act of declaration to the lady in front of me that I am now yours. Do you see the difference? It wasn't me saying, no longer, I cannot do this. Yes, that might be part of it. But it was me declaring my pledge to her moving forward. 
And it's the same thing for you and I. This is the purge that Paul is talking about, that, that, that you and I. And, and again, I, I could give you the Old Testament reference here. And, and in the Old Testament, the Jews, they could not touch dead things and they could not touch certain animals. And so what would happen if they touched a dead body, if they touched a, quote, unclean animal? There was this purging process they would have to do to cleanse themselves. And thank God we don't have to, be, we don't have to do that anymore. Thank God we just sung about it. What can wash away my sins? What can make me whole again? Nothing but the blood of Jesus that washes me so white as snow, that cleanses me, that purges my life. But for you and I, it's this constant process that you and I have to do that it's this word that all, I hate it, it's this word of personal purity. That no, I don't have to worry about touching unclean animals or, or dead bodies. That's creepy anyways. But what about unclean thought processes that I allow in my life? What about unclean ways of ha- handling my anger? What, what about unclean and dead ways of handling hurts in my life? That's what Paul is talking about for us. That it's this purge that you and I have to do it in our life. And again, does this mean that we write off everything not of, not of God? Do we write off every person not of God? No, not at all. No, it doesn't mean you go home and unfriend and unfollow everybody that you have on social media that's not a Christ follower. But it does mean that you don't respond the way on social media the way they do. No, that doesn't mean that you go to work and you write off every person that, that does not know Christ and does not love God and does not go to church. No, that does not mean that at all. But it means that you don't hold grudges the way they do. It's this purge. No, no, that doesn't mean that you walk into your family and say, listen, every one of you who does not believe in God and you do not know, you do not know Jesus, your Lord and Savior, like I do, I can no longer talk to you. No, that does not mean that. But that means you learn to serve your family in a way that they don't know how to serve other people. He says this is purge. That not necessarily we write everything off that is not as God, but it's something that we do. See, see you, know, you know what concerns me in our church culture today, particularly in the Western world? The thing that concerns me is that uh, the very thing that we disdained just a year and a two years ago that, that we didn't like and we didn't like about our culture, it has crept right into the church world. I'll give you an example. Cancel culture. Hated it. Everybody talked about it. And I'm not going to get political this morning, but let me just give you an example of why this is what Apostle Paul is talking about. The, the very attitude that the world had, that if they disagreed with you, then they're not talking to you. If they disagree with you, cancel. If they disagree with you, get off social media. If they disagree with you, you don't talk to me. If they disagree with you, I'm writing you off. Has moved right into our own church community. Well, I don't talk to those people anymore. Well, I don't agree with their view, so I'm not going to talk to them. Well, I don't agree with them, so I'm deleting them. I'm blocking them. I don't agree with what they said, so you know what? They're not my friend anymore. Really? The very thing that you couldn't stand a year ago is now a common practice in your life. He says there has to be this difference in how the world handles conflicts and how a Christian handles conflict. There has to be this person. Now, hear me. I'm not saying we don't have standards, and I'm not saying that we don't, that we don't uh, you know, disagree and stand for the truth of God 1,000%. You better know your word, and you better stand for truth. But I think in the church community, hear me, in the Western world particularly, there, too many people have become so good at telling the world what they're against, and they've lost the real message of the gospel in telling them what they're for. Oh, it's quiet in here now. I'm in your driveway, I know. Oh, we'll tell somebody quick. We'll write a, we'll write a post on social media about, about this person and that person and that company and this company. And listen, I'm not saying don't have standards. I'm not saying that you don't support the love of God. But we're quick at picking up a picket sign. We're not quick at going and sitting and having a cup of coffee with somebody we disagree with. That's the gospel message. The gospel message is good news. The gospel message is that Jesus died for one and for all. The gospel message is in spite of your shortcomings, in spite of your circumstances, in in spite of how you feel, in spite of what you think, in spite of your political affiliation, in spite of the color of your skin, that Jesus died for you. He paid a price for you. That is the gospel good news. And if we're not careful, we allow the world begin to dictate how we respond to people. Paul says you got to purge yourself of that. This word holiness that we don't like to talk about, that we don't think. He says, you got to purge yourself, come on, Lindsay, of those thoughts, of those attitudes, of those things in your life that you've allowed the world to sneak in inside of you. And it's diluted and it's convoluted and it's distorted the gospel message in you and through you. Oh, I know that's not fun to hear. 
Holy Spirit, what is inside of me this morning that needs to be purged? Holy Spirit, what is inside of us this morning? And, and then, but look, he doesn't just stop there. If, if he said, listen, you just got to purge yourself and you gave you no hope and he gave you no answer, then that would be pretty depressing. You would say, man, I got a lot of work to do. But watch, then he gives you the promise. He gives us the promise of being different. So what does it mean? What does it look like to be different? Positionally, my purpose as I begin to allow the Holy Spirit to purge me, because I can't do it on my own, because everything inside of me says hang on to those feelings. Everything inside of me says hang on to those grudges. Everything inside of me says hang on to those, to those hurts and those habits. But as I allow the Holy Spirit to purge me, but watch, then it says in verse 18, here's the promise. He says, and I will be a father to you. <laughs> I love it. And you will be my sons and my daughters, says the Lord. He says, when you begin to come out and be separate, he says, I'm going to be a father to you. It's this promise of God's blessing that God becomes our father. Hear me this morning. God becomes our father when, when we trust Jesus Christ as our Savior. There's nothing we can do to earn his love. There's nothing we can do to make ourselves better. There's nothing we can do to, to, for God to say, oh, you know what? Matt was really good today. I'm really going to bless him. That's not how God works. God's our father simply because of what Jesus Christ did on the cross. We can come to him and we can have relationship with him. So watch. Salvation means I share the Father's life. All right, that's what I get. Get the Father's life. Salvation means I, I share the Father's life. But watch this. But separation, separation means that I enter fully into the Father's love. I'm going to give you scripture to back this up. So what does, does God love me right now? Well, absolutely he does. 1,000% he loves you. I'll give you an example. Students come to my house all the time. My doors are always open. Teenagers come hang out, right? Small groups will come hang out. My, my boys will have their friends over. And they get to come into my house because of who my sons are, and they get to experience and have the things in my house. Refrigerator's open. I always tell them, hey, make yourself at home. Refrigerator's yours. Cabinet's yours. I got a couple snacks in there. Those are mine. Everything else, that's yours. No, I don't do that. But I, I tell them everything's theirs. Right, come on in, come on to the house, make yourself at home. They Watch, they get to experience the life. Watch, I'm going to show you. They get to experience the life because of the relationship of, of me and my son, right? They have relationship with me because of the relationship of my kids. Does that make sense to you, right? But there's something different about the love that I have for my sons. Because they're separate. Their last name is my name, right? So when they walk into my house, it's different. Than when one of their friends walked in my house. Now, I hugged their friends. I high-fived their friends. I, you know, I love on their friends. But, but it's something different about them because they're separate from everyone else. So watch. So let me, go, let me give you scripture now. Write it down. Go read it this week. John chapter 14, verse 21 through 23. I never saw this. But Jesus promises that there's this deeper love that God can have for us. Because watch in verse 21. He says, whoever has my commands and keeps them is the one who loves me. The one who loves me will be loved by my Father, and I too will love them and show myself to them. Then Judas, not Judas Iscariot, not the one who betrayed Jesus, but then Jesus said, Judas said, but Lord, why do you intend to show yourself to us and not to the world? It's a good question. Jesus replied, watch, here, here it is. Anyone who loves me will obey my teaching. My Father will love them, and we will come to them and make our home with them. Do you see it? It's this deeper sense of love. So watch, salvation means I, I, I share the Father's life, but separation means I enter deeply into the Father's love. There's this, there's this deeper connection that I have with my Heavenly Father when I begin to separate from those things of life. When I begin to separate from those attitudes. We got, when I begin to separate of those habits, those ways of thinking. They can be destructive to the gospel message. It doesn't mean that I, I don't get to heaven. It doesn't, doesn't mean that he doesn't love me anymore when those things. But when I begin to separate those things and his Holy Spirit begins to clean me out even more, I, I get this deeper relationship. And all oh, listen, I get it. There's so much pressure to conform to normal. Signs are posted everywhere telling us what to what path to take? Here's how you get happiness. Here's how you get success. Here's how you get satisfaction. Here's how you get joy. Here's how you get peace. But I wonder in our life, what would it look like if we looked at everything around us that is, quote, normal, and we said, no, I'm going to be different. 
What, what, would, what would we experience in, in our own life? What would it look like if the purge in our life? What would it look like if positionally this morning you understood who you were? What would it look like this morning if the purpose of God, the things that you've allowed the world to attach on you, if you begin to shake those things off? Come on, all over this place, I want you to stand. Because can I tell you, newsflash, normal isn't working. Normal is getting us nowhere. But can I tell you, God is ready for us to be a people. A people that is different. To parent different. To be married different. To be a teenager on that sports field different. To be a teacher in the classroom different. Coming all over this place, I want you to bow your heads right now. And come on, as a sign of surrender before we even pray, can you lift up both hands to God if you're comfortable this morning? Come on, I want you to lift up both hands to God this morning. Listen, I know, oh, I felt it in this room that for some of you, I've been in your driveway this morning. It's so easy for us to come in and to put our smile on and to put our Sunday outfit on and come in. And yet we've been thinking and living and acting like the world and, and we wonder why we're on this roller coaster. Listen, God is calling us out this morning. He's calling me out this morning. It's time to be different. So come on with your hands raised before we even pray. Holy Spirit, begin to search us this morning. Come on, ask him right that. Holy Spirit, search me right now. God, what is it? God, what is it? Is it you need to remind me of my position? God, what is it this morning? Is it you need to remind me of the purpose? God, what is it this morning? You need to purge me, God, of some things? God, what is it? I forgot the promise. Come on, right there where you sit before we even pray. Holy Spirit, search us this morning. God, send your spirit to begin to point it out. God, surgically, you've been cutting away some things this morning. I felt you in the operating room. Come on, sing that over your life this morning. I want you to, de to declare that over your life this morning. That God is not mad at you. That God loves you. He has a plan for you. He has a purpose for you. He has a position for you. He has a promise for you. Come on, declare that I am. Come on, sing, I am chosen. I am chosen. Not forsaken. different people today, God. God, we are thinking different today, Jesus. God, we are walking different today, God. Change us, Lord, from the inside out. Come on, sing that over your life today. God, you're changing. God, we are your son. We are your daughter today, Lord. to stand right there with your eyes closed, your heads bowed. Come on, you said this morning, Pastor Matt, as you were speaking, the, the Holy Spirit, the Lord, you didn't even know what it was, but it was the Holy Spirit dealing with you. And you said, you know what, I haven't surrendered my life to Christ. I haven't surrendered my life to God, but today I want to I wanna do that. I want to start that son, that daughter relationship. You said that's me. I want you to throw your hand up right where you stand. You said that's me today. I'm going to wait for a second. You say that's me today. You say, that's me today. You're watching online. You say, that's me. I want you to chat it in. I'm ready to surrender. Listen, for the rest of us here today, we, we've surrendered our life. But if we're honest with ourselves, we've allowed ourselves to be yoked up with things that are not of God. We've allowed culture. We've allowed the world. And if you're here today, you say, Pastor Matt, you know what? Today, I need prayer to, to be reminded of the purpose. Come on, that's me. You say, I need to be reminded of the purpose. Yeah, I see some hands. 
You say, you know what, Pastor Matt, today I need to be reminded of the position that God has, that I have with the Lord. You say, that's me. I want you to throw your hand up. You say, that's me. I need to be reminded of the position I have. You say, you know what, Pastor Matt, I need to be purged of some things today. There's some thoughts, there's some habits, there's some attitudes. There's some things I've been hanging on. Come on, throw your hand up. Don't be ashamed. You say, yeah, I see hands up all over this place. I need to be purged of some things. This is what I want you to do. Right where you stand, I want you to put your hand on that person's shoulder. You may not even know their name, and that's fine. Hands went up all over this place. And you may not even know what they're battling this morning. You may not know what they're going through. But this is what I want us to do. I want us to pray over that person over on your right, on your left, as you touch their shoulder. Again, you may not even know what it is, but come on. I want us to pray together that God, by his spirit, by his power, would uh, allow them, would give them the ability to be different. God, we come before you today. Come on, let's pray, men and women. Come on, we're praying for online. We're praying in North Judson and Westville. God, we come before you today. God, at Wanata, God, at every location here at Valpo, God, you saw hands go up all over this place. God, Lord, that some of us, God, we need to be reminded of the purpose that you have for us. God, we've allowed this world to, Lord, attach, Lord, ideas, or thought processes, things that are that have happening around us. It's attached itself to us. And God, Lord, today, Lord, we need to be reminded positionally of who you say that we are. God, today, Lord, there's some things in our life that need to be purged. God, there's some attitudes, there's some thoughts. God, there's habits. God, there's ways that we're dealing with unforgiveness, God. Lord, there's attached. God, today, purge us right now by your spirit. Lord, purge us right now by your presence, by your power. God, thank you, Lord, for your promise. Lord, we want to experience the fullness of your love. So, God, today, come on, say this with me now. God, today, I'm coming out. Come on, say it. God, today, I'm coming out. Throw those hands up. God, today, I'm coming out, and I'm going to be different. Come on, say it over your life. God, today, I'm coming out. I'm going to be a different dad. I'm going to be a different husband. I'm going to be a different Christ follower. I'm going to be a different son. I'm going to be a different student. Come on, tell him today. Declare that over your life now. God, we will be different. God, by your power, we will be different. Come on, declare that now over your life. I am chosen, Lord. Thank you, God, that you are setting us up. Thank you, God, that we are positioned. Thank you, God, that we have what you say we have. Give God a hand clap of praise this morning for that word over your life. Be different. Come on to the person you're standing next to. Look at them. Say, be different this week. Be different this week. Listen, it's, it's, not, a, it's not a one-time prayer. It's not a one-time service. Every morning, I got to wake up. Sometimes I don't get it right, Johnny, but I, I wake up every morning and I say, man, you got to be different. I handle a situation and I walk out of it and I was like, you did that wrong. You got to go be different. Sometimes that means I might even have to go back and apologize to some people. Say, I got to make this right. But listen, it's an everyday process. And so I want to remind you this week as you go, be different. Be different. It's not easy. When the world tries to attach stuff to you, habits, attitude, be different. Think different. Live different. Parent different. Teach different. Be a student different. I want to remind you, next Sunday, we kick off a new series. I want to remind you about our Lethal Faith Weekend. Hey, if you're a student, I want to talk to you. If you're a parent of a student, I want to talk to you. But listen, as you go this week, come on one more time. God, thank you for your word this morning over our life. 
And God, as we go this week, God, I pray, Lord, that when your Holy Spirit comes and begins to purge and begins to point out, God begins to do surgery on us. God, I pray, Lord, we we'll submit to your power. God, thank you, Lord, for your goodness. God, I pray that you'll keep them safe as they go. God, bless them as they go in. Bless as they go out. God, help us be world changers and different makers. God, as we go to our city, as we go to our families, as we go to our schools, God, you be with us. You guide us. Protect us. In Jesus' mighty name, amen and amen. Hey, we love you. You be blessed. You have a good week. We'll see you back next Sunday.